Without further ado, I'd like to present the call over to Matthew Ronan, Director of Research and Technology at the National Kidney Registry. Thank you, Andre, and uh, thank you, Massimo, for joining us and co-presenting today. Uh, so we have a good agenda. We're going to be talking about what the Kidney for Life initiative is. We'll talk about the science and data behind the Kidney for Life initiative. We'll go over the expert system. We'll go over the new antibody screening and why it's important for the quality assurance and performance improvement. And then we'll talk a little bit about the prospective study and clinical trials that are undergoing. Andre, next slide. So the Kidney for Life Initiative's primary goal is better donor and recipient matching. The goal is to reduce the risk of de novo antibodies, lower the risk of rejection, leading to less risk of graft failure. One of the side, side benefits is also the potential for safe reduction of immunosuppression and diminishing the side effects from that immunosuppressive medication. Next slide. So I'd like to turn the call over to Massimo Mangiola from the NYU lab to talk about the science behind the Kidney for Life initiative. Thank you, Massimo. Thank you, Matt. Um, okay, so to, to explain the, the role of epilim mismatch or epilim in general in solid organ transplantation, I like to I like to approach this by by three essential steps, right? Now the first step is that of understanding what is an applet and the role the applet has in the adaptive immune response post transplant, right? So we're going to talk about this right away. So as you know, the HLA antigen that you see right here is is composed is a very complex amino acid structure. And it disperses within the structure. There are these hot spots. They are here colored in yellow. Uh, that are uh, immunogenic, which means that we have uh, evidence that the immune system of the patient develops antibody against these hot spots. And for the most, everybody calls these other spots HLA applets, right? Now, when you compare two molecules, uh, for example, that of a patient and on a donor. Uh, you see that between the two molecules, there's a lot of similarities, which is represented by the magenta color. You see how much magenta is there in both of them. But then there are these, there are differences in these hot spots, in these yellow areas in, in, in the two structures. In, in those yellow patches, those are the HLA applets. Now, following exposure to a known self HLA antigen, for example, this one on the right, right? The your immune system can detect those differences and actually develop an immune response against it, okay? Now, to give you a better view of these, uh, of, of these applets and where they are, how would they do, let's imagine that we can unravel this HLA applet this HLA molecule structure in, in, a, in a longitudinal chain, right? Now, this chain is going to be done by a, a group of amino acids that are sort of conserved, and this is the, they, they form the core structure of the protein chain. And then with this, within this core structure, you have dispersed in there some immunogenic amino acid here depicted with this different uh, you know, hearts and 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 and, and uh, other uh, uh, color stuff, right? Now those are the applets, right? Dispersed among the amino acid structure, and this is what can cause if your immune system detects as them as known self. This is what can cause rejection. Now, in the past, right, when we were comparing recipient and donor, we were looking at their HLA nomenclature number. For example, let's imagine a recipient that is a DR0101 and a donor that is 1101. And, you know, we were saying they are no match. The numbers are different. It's very obvious, right? And we were saying, well, they are no match. There is no difference between them. And we were considering every no match donor is equally mismatched to your recipient. They are all no match after all, right? We know now that this is not entirely true because there is a degree of mismatch between patient and donors. And the applets is what gives you the degree of mismatch between patient and donors. So how do we go about these days, right? And what is behind what the, the what is behind the NKR and the calculation for applets? We unravel these structures in, in, in this longitudinal pro, amino acid structure. And now we can compare recipient and donors by the level of uh, similarity that they have to one another, right? And you can see very clearly that this one, this one, this one are shared between recipient and donors. However, this one and this one are unique to them. 
Now, by doing this, we can compare the molecular structure of the patient and donors HLA and say, for example, in this example, donor shares three out of five applets with the recipient, those ones right here. Or you can say, if you want, that the donor has two mismatched applets with the recipient, these two right there. Now, why is this important to us, right? The, the importance to this is that we have plenty of evidence and I didn't wanna single anybody out that is seeing an incredible amount of literature out there. So I'm bringing you just four of the most recent and most impactful, but all of them are saying the same story. Mismatch applets is what cause humoral and cellular rejection. And I want to show you that this is not voodoo science, right? This is not just we met it up. So here is what happens after transplant. So this is in the indirect pathway of presentation, and that leads to, to the generation of de novo sensitization. That will be a B cell, your own B cell, the patient B cell, that will have a B cell receptor that, that is, after, after all, is, is, is an immunoglobulin, right? And this immunoglobulin is specific for a B cell epitope, what we call B cell epitope. What is specific too is a mismatch applet that is present in a donor mis in a mismatch donor actually antigen. When these BCR can bind to this mismatch applet, this antigen will be internalized, processed, and presented in the class two the B cells in a form of a peptide that contains one of these mismatched uh, hotspot applets. Right, and the B cell is now activated. Sometime concurrent with this phenomenon, the recipient APC will chew up either an entire cell or donor cell, so just an HLA antigen, donor antigen, process it, and present a peptide that is unique of the donor that presents unique applets of the donor to the T cell. The T cell sees this peptide, gets activated, likes it. This is non self. Now, long after, these two cells will meet each other in the germinal center. And when they meet each other in germinal center and the T cell and the B cell cooperation will lead to the specific humoral and cellular rejection against the target that they saw at the beginning in the peripheral blood. So the, the, this is the first step, right? What is an applet? What the applets cause? And I'm showing you the mechanism. Is there any question at this point that you want me to answer? If, if no question, but can, can, uh, is anybody monitoring the chat or something? All right. If no, if no question, I will move on. Okay. So step number two for me in this process of, of digesting apple mismatch in solid organ transplantation is to prove, to explain, to show that each donor is, brings a different uh, a, a different array of apple mismatch. So a patient can be differently mismatched to multiple donors. And of course, different donors, because they bring different apple mismatch, can cause a different immune response system. All right, let's look into this. As I was saying in the past, we were looking at patient and donor like in a monochromatic way. You know, the patient is blue, the donor is gray. Are they a match? No. Are they one haplotype match? Yes or no? This one was based on the nomenclature, did not give us any quality from the perspective of the immunological risk of transplanting these two individuals. But now we know that what we need to look at is the dissimilarity. And the HLA is like making us multicolor, right? And we need to match colors, and the colors are the applets. The, the, the higher the amount of applets, the higher the risk of developing a, a de novo sensitization. So the applet mismatch is giving us the degree of difference between a patient and a donor and describe the immunological risk. And we know, I just showed you that there is a direct correlation between the amount of mismatch and the likelihood of developing an immune response. So when we look at a donor and a, a, a patient and we say like, all right, uh, we have a bunch of donors. Of course, the best practice is to find a match, right? You want the match, but that doesn't happen all the time. We know that, right? So the next step that we need to look at is which one in the pool 
of donors is the one that is the most similar to my patient. Why? Because the more the similarity, the less the mismatch applets, which translate in a less uh, probability that the mismatch applet will start an immunological fire. Let me let me let me put this in in a you know I like to put this in a different way that is more practical, right? All right, let's look at these three devices. We got a stick, we got a flint, and we're a flamethrower. And and if I would ask you to put on the chat which one of, of, of these three is more likely to start a fire, I think without looking at the chat, I think we can all agree that the flamethrower is the one that most likely is going to start a fire the first, right? All right, now let's assume I can give you four donors and those donors are otherwise similarly medically and surgically. Literally, you can cover your eyes and point and that's the, 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 the donor you would choose. They're identical to you otherwise. But I'm, I'm going to add you the information that they, they have a different degree of mismatch and one is very low or no mismatch and one is high mismatch. Now, if I would ask you, in your opinion, of these four donors that you see right here, which one is the most likely to start an immunological fire? I think also here we'll be agreeing on the fact that the one on the left is less likely, but this one on the right is more likely, right? So this is how you frame, in my opinion, the role, the importance of the problem mismatch and how you discern between, between donors, right? Questions? Again, if you're dialed in, you can press star six on your cell phone to ask a, to unmute yourself and ask a question, or you can unmute by pressing the unmute button at the bottom of your screen. You could also so, ask- Yes, there is yeah, a, there is a question. question. I have a question. Go ahead. Um, this is Miquel Prieto from Mayo Clinic. You know, I mean, this all this stuff is, of course, for me, fascinating, and it sounds like very interesting. And um, I have had, I have a couple of my colleagues who have looked at the data very, very thoroughly, the, the published papers that talk about this, yeah. and they are not that impressed that the data, when you look at the groups and how they were selected and how many on each group they were, um, they, 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 they are still skeptics that, that we have hardcore evidence uh, that this is real. It, it sounds very interesting the way you are presenting it. And I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that you are going to convince me that the, there is clear and convincing data to show that all this is true in terms of developing donor-specific antibodies and stuff like that. Yes, it's a, it's a very it's a very important question. Thank you for that. So, so um, number one, um, the 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 goal here is not to use the applets to decide a donor, regardless of all the other parameters, right? You still need to do the job. That was the point three, right? You still need to do the job of deciding donor based on medical, surgical, and age difference, and ABO, everything else, right? Then, then this is when you come the, the next layer. Would I would I would ask you my my counter question to you would be: Are your colleague um, okay with accepting that the HLA antigen mismatch is? Uh, relevant to transplantation? If the answer is yes, I, I, if, if the answer is yes, we would agree that being more matched at the antigen is better than being non-matched, then I'm telling you, uh, then you're almost there. The only difference here is that you need to forget about the number and embrace the fact that the applets are leveling out the difference in, either, in every direction, in the direction of the mismatch and in the direction of the match. What I'm saying is that you can have a DR1 and you can have a DR4 mismatch and you say they are mismatched, but after all, the difference between DR1 and DR4 is not that significant and is still like an acceptable mismatch. What I wanna go to with this is this. And it was exactly what I was showing in the image before, which is if, if we agree that the antigen mismatch, the mismatch HLA antigen is what caused the rejection, which we have proved by antibody, flow cross match, flow PRA, surrogate cross match, and pathology where you have AMR, 
right? That is, uh, you say, well, that's AMR caused by HLA antigen that binds HLA antibody. Then those antibodies are binding to applets, are binding to HLA motif. They are not binding to the A24 or the A1 or the DR7. They are binding to a specific hot spot, one or more amino acids in the surface of the HLA molecule. And this, this is the applet, right? So the target of the immunity is not the DR4. The target of the immunity is a peptide presented to T cells and by B cells to the T cells that express a, a donor specific motif, which is the applet, right? So it, it's like, change. I was explaining this not too long ago, it's just like changing currency. I, I, I was in Italy when Italy changed from Lira to Euro, right? We need to rethink about the entire process and what that meant. That's what needs to be done. I think everybody in this call will agree that a, a three out of six ABDR match is better than zero out of six. Yeah. But what are we actually matching in these things is the differences. A three out of six mismatch can actually be a, a zero mismatch for the R&D queue. A, 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 a zero out of six can <clears throat> still be a good favorable DQ. Well, that, that, that's exactly my situation. For example, uh, I, I do uh, pediatric kidney transplants, right? And I have a father who is 31, perfect donor, wants to give a kidney to his son who is five. And uh, he's, uh, he's high, high risk applet mismatch, but he's of course a three out of six HLA. And I need to tell him it's better if we use your kidney for somebody else and get a kidney from a stranger for your son that has a lower risk applet mismatch. And you're convinced that that's a right, the right thing to do? So, uh, uh, of, of, yeah, to, to me, to me, the process is this because uh, it, it is a fact, and we can discuss offline for for days if you want. It yeah. is a fact the immunity is against this specific mismatched out spot. Some, not all of them. We can debate forever, but in whatever is there is caused by this mismatch, right? So in my mind, if I would have to suggest a process, I would say step one, do you have an ABDR match that is related? If you do stop, that's the best could ever happen to a patient. The, the, the survival and the quality of a related ABDR match is superior to anything you can find out there, right? We know that. If you don't have a match, right? If you don't have an ABDR match, I think what we need to do is to is to look at uh, immediately to the other angle, which is if if I don't have a match, what I need to do is to reduce the number of mismatch in the off chance that I also reduce the probability of rejection. Theoretically, if if you mismatch 125 million tablets and your patient always take immune suppression, always follow the rules and always that that, everything should be fine, right? But what if you have to, right? So if given the possibility, which includes age of patient and age of donor, uh, comorbidities, how how quickly you have to transplant, it might turn out to you know. There is a lot of emotional component in, 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 in donation within the family. I mean, there is a lot of parameters you need to consider. But I think it's worth to bring up the discussion to our patients and donors that there is an improvement that we can make to the compatibility level if, he's, if we are not matched. And Massimo, let's start moving on to the next section so we can talk about it in more detail. Yes, yes. There, there are a couple of questions. You wanna wanna push it? Oh, I answered them. I answered them in the chats. Okay, and and yeah, for for Bob Bray, uh, yes, there might be, and probably there is a difference in things that are more likely to develop uh, 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 an immune response than others. But uh, we don't know that yet. We are working very hard. I know that you are working very hard as well to find that. We'll see what we lead, what we go with that. Let me finish. 
and we'll take it. So the third, third step for me is, is that, uh, that we start discussing, which is donor selection does, should not change. So we start from a group, a cohort of donors that are medically surgically equally. So you, you could uh, transplant. So here the point is to, uh, is to advise patient and donors that uh, although they are HLA compatible and, and, you know, mentioning this thing could be like, so it's a, it's a kind of art, you know what I mean? The, 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 the fact that you are HLA compatible solely means that you don't have, the patient does not have antibody against the donor. It doesn't mean anything else. It doesn't mean that that donor is immunologically low risk as compared to the other donor. We are just saying that there are no HLA antibody, flow cross match, predicted negative or physically negative. But if, if, you, if you have this spread of donors, if you have the possibility of more than one donor, I think we have to do genetic molecular compatibility assessment so that basically you look at, 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 at degrees of compatibility. You can say, this is the best, this is the better, this is the worst case scenario. And in this case, I think, it is worth to have a discussion to say there is evidence out there, pretty good significant evidence in my opinion, <clears throat> that some of these mismatches will cause rejection. We can try to find a better combination where we give you a higher probability of avoiding rejection. So for most of us, uh, we don't have a pool of internal donors that's good enough to, 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 to do that, right? So we need to tap in in a national pool. And that's why we team up with, with the NKR and, and the Kidney for Life initiative. Because after all, for most patients, when you go look at the potential donors that are there, this is what you see. You have a lot of greens. And I took, I didn't want to in purpose take the best case scenario where you see a lot of zero. I'm giving you the intermediate situation, but you see that even in intermediate situation, you have a bunch, a bunch of opportunities right there that you don't have. So if this is your recipient and this is your donor, I think it's a I think it's worth to bring up the possibility of improving the compatibility. And, 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 and propose, propose to, to use this initiative. Matt, uh, thank you. Back to you, unless there is uh, additional questions you want me to. Thank you, Massimo. I appreciate you taking the time to explain that. Just wanna give uh, everybody one quick um, second to just ask any additional questions of Massimo. Okay. Uh, so the next section, we'll be talking about the data behind the Kidney for Life program. Andrea, next slide, please. So there was a paper that was published last year in the New, uh, New England Journal of Medicine, essentially saying beyond one year, most graft losses were due to chronic rejection. We know de novo DSA formation is the primary driver of graft loss after reading this paper. If you go to the next slide, there's some additional quotes in there. Uh, strategies such as performing transplantation in recipients with two HLA DR matches, matching at the amino acid level, eplet matching, as opposed to the whole molecule level, and approving immunosuppression for those with high eplet mismatch have been shown to decrease the risk of de novo donor specific antibody formation and acute rejection to approve long term survival. Prevention of acute rejection remains the key to achieving long term graft survival. Acute rejection negatively affects long-term survival, and acute rejection is the result of suboptimal immunosuppressive therapy, particularly in transplant recipients at high immunologic risk. So those are all quotes from that paper. It's a very good paper to read. There'll be a link to it at the end of um, the materials as well. So this is a summary here of the research that has been published previously. There's a wide variety here. Um, there are some studies that are about 50% of the population was living donor transplants, mostly in, the, in the, the Americas. And then over in Europe, there's a higher concentration of deceased donor transplants that make up these studies. But you can see in each of these studies with various uh, sample sizes, you know, the risk of creating uh, de novo DSA was, was much higher uh, with the high epilet mismatch load and much lower uh, with a low epilet mismatch load. If you go to the next slide, 
This is uh, just, we're looking at the Colorado study here that showed the percentage of de novo DSA formed within 12 months post-transplant. And you can see using those same categories from the original Nickerson papers, a high EPWIT mismatch, 17% of those patients developed de novo DSA. Medium, it was 11%. And if they had a low EPWIT mismatch, it was only 1%. And that one case was already proven to be a, a case where the, the recipient was not compliant with their immunosuppressive medication. So these are very interesting results that we're seeing so far in these early studied papers. Uh, we'll also be publishing a paper as well uh, that shows the results that we've, we've come across so far. Uh, if you go to the next slide, you can see the ramp up in the DNA collection through the Kidney for Life initiative. The big jump up in the third quarter of 2021 was a result of the launch of the uh, NKR's expert system, which we're going to talk about in just a moment. You can see that it looks like around 70% of the uh, kits that are shipped out are ultimately returned. Next slide. So here we're going to start talking about the expert system, but I just wanted to pause for a moment and see if anybody had any questions about the slides or the research papers that we went over very briefly. Matt, there is a question in the chat. Okay, let's see. What do you say to those? What do you say to those who say they can perform sequence alignments between mismatched antigens, alleles, and make their soft assessment on the level of mismatch without looking specifically at epitopes? Massimo, can you take that yeah. one? Yeah, so if I understand well, you just look at, you're saying you're looking at a sequence of two proteins and look at the mismatch antigens and just say, what's, what's the mismatch right there without looking at epitopes? Yes, the, the, the key here is what is immunogenic, potential immunogenic? We don't know the degree, but what is immunogenic? And I'm say immunogenic because for, for most antibody, we have anti, for most epitopes, Epilets, we have anti antibodies approved the that the, the, the an antibody is done they have to be in the surface of the actually antigen so uh, if you look at something that is embedded or is covered by the peptide of course that would not cause an immunological response so i think the alignment is good but then once you find the difference you need to ensure in a 3d structure that they are actually exposed thank you massimo Hey, Matt, I noticed we got uh, Raja Kandiswamy on the line. Um, Raja, can you, uh, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. So, so before we jump into the expert system, uh, you and your team were the ones that developed this uh, with us and kind of guided the effort. Um, do you have a few kind of uh, general thoughts before we dive into the expert system based on your experience with this? You guys have got a lot of low epilet mismatch transplants done in the last year, and I think your experience would be worth hearing. Yeah, so I think uh, I think some of the points that were made by and Massimo gave a very good presentation on on the uh, data so far in the uh, that that uh, gives you the benefit of epilet matching, and rightly there were a few uh, critiques that came out of uh, this uh, this this presentation. Um, Mikkel and others asked some questions which are very pertinent, I think. Uh, but I think if we start uh, looking at uh, holes in the in the applet data, there's going to be holes. There's no question, right? I mean, it's not absolute. Uh, Mike Shecker is on the call. He knows in the early years of HLA matching, uh, we didn't know how to make sense of it. It took several years before we got good data to understand what matters and some things are still open now as we're learning. So, so I think there's gonna be a while before we get to the bottom line on applets. But for starters, we know that it's at least four large retrospective, I repeat, retrospective studies that have shown the value of applet matching in terms specifically of donor-specific antibody formation. Whether it leads to graft survival and immunologic loss rate and all that, is extrapolations, and that's where most of the critiques come from. But I think there's very little criticism to, to, to that correlation that, that um, a higher degree of epilet mismatch leads to a higher degree of antibody formation in retrospective studies with a mix of deceased donors and living donors. That's another knock against those studies. They're not, you know, they're not predominantly living donor studies. They have a mix of uh, 
living and deceased donors. So those are all the, 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 the holes you can point out in that, but you can't take away that, that, that the fact was, it was reproduced in four different studies in four different countries actually, and uh, showing about the same results in, in retrospective data. The other critique is that these were man-made kind of uh, parameters that were set. It's almost like um, you had the answer already figured out and you were looking for the steps that would prove the answer by setting limits for what applet mismatch numbers should be in the DR for low, intermediate, and high. Pete Nickerson initially, you know, played with different models to see where the separation would occur, and he got the, uh, the slots where the separation occurred. But that's hypothesis-driven approach in any clinical study. You, you make a hypothesis and then you look to see if there are differences and you readjust the parameters based on significance of difference. I know Massimo wants to, uh, wants to make a comment here, but I will just finish by saying that yes, the, those were kind of retrospectively gone back and readjusted and that's another knock against it. And the last knock is the quality of mismatch. It's not just the quantity of mismatch. I think Dr. Bray brought that up. Do, do some applets mat matter more than other? I don't think we know all the truth in that. But given all that weakness, I think we still have an enhancement over the existing state, which is uh, six antigens. So I think we got the DRDQ uh, sites, which are the main drivers of antibody formation, and looking at a more detailed level of applets to try and predict DSA formation. Massimo? Thank you. Yes, uh, what I mean, you, you, thank you, Raj. You brought up fantastic points. Um, uh, first of all, uh, cutoffs. I, I personally do not believe in a rigid cutoff. This is immunology. This is this is not this is not something that you can box. All right. It, it is practically impossible to me to 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 accept that seven DR mismatch, six DR mismatch is no risk and 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 seven or eight are right you, you need to let go on that right we don't have the granularity to tell you exactly the number and i don't know if we'll ever know right but remember this this was initially described as risk for an event a medical event antibody the first time amr after a you know chronic these are rejection of whatever it is, right? It's risk, right? Which means that four and 40 is still risk, right? Is that 40 is more risk because you're just giving the immune system more chances to be pissed off, to be purely <laughs> honest, right? But four is still risk. If your patient doesn't take immune, immune suppression and there is only four mismatches and three of them are DQ7, I promise you, you will see DQ7. There's no chance, no question asked, right? So you need to see this as risk, as like adding fuel to an already brush fire, right? The more you put in, the more risk is that the thing is, is going to blow on you if there is the condition for that. So don't get hung up on the risk. It's absolutely true what Raj has been saying. The hypothesis was that this was creating a problem. Then it was found something that made statistical significance. And yes, I'm not saying that this is wrong, but you don't have to get so fixated on that. What is the scope here to me? And what I would recommend my nephrologist if I, if I was asked for that, right? If I may ask for that. If you have the opportunity, give the immune system less reason to be mad. If you can do that, it's still a benefit. After all, we've been doing that with the antigen forever, and the antigen does not give you any good intel because the nomenclature is not based on similarity. The nomenclature of the HLA is based on when those antigens were discovered, A1 before A3 and before A11. But guess what? A1 and A11, A3 are more similar to each other than A1 and A2. And A1 and A81 is more similar than A2 and A24. So you, you are switching to another level of looking at compatibility and, and then you try to minimize, minimize, right? That, that's what we want to do. So, and, and yes, I agree also with you, Raja, more is not necessarily worse because quality for sure matters. We just don't know. We don't have enough prospective study and other studies to prove 
uh, what is more relevant, but um, uh, risk is a calculated risk. If I can add to that, Garrett, for a second. Um, the, um, uh, we used applet matching prior to uh, the Edmonton study coming out. We used imputed applet matching. Our director of the HLA lab would sit and look at imputed applet match based off the databases and, and give us some data on, on patients that were hard to match. So we already were using it. And now that we can actually do it based off, uh, off of a high resolution typing, it's enhanced our utilization of it and it's made it more systematic. Uh, in order to avoid the, the actual cutoffs, like you said, uh, a, our coordinators will often not necessarily look at the, the green, yellow, and red, but often they'll say this is a medium mismatch. However, it's a low medium, a low medium risk or a high low risk. A high low risk and a low medium risk may not be much different at all, like Massimo was saying. It depends on what the actual antigens are. And we have an immunologist sitting with us at every one of these meetings. We meet every morning at 11.30 AM. Some of my colleagues are on the call. They've been great at working with us. And we look through this along with the director of the HLA lab and, and actually look to see what the fine points are. We still don't know the quality, but we get the best guess from our PhD director of the immunology lab. So that's what we do in practice. And Mikhail, in answer to your point, in a pediatric patient, if there's a high applet mismatch and it's a true large applet mismatch load, we would advise them to go for a, uh, a better match in terms of applets, especially in pediatrics due to the high immunogenicity of kids. I yeah, think you were bringing that up because actually not too long ago, I had that situation, Raja, when the only possibility was moderate, right? The, the true moderate, but between three or four of them, I suggest I recommended to get the moderate where the moderate was caused by the DR, but not the DQ. The DQ was very low. And because all of us know, because we all of us see the Luminex, right, single antigen beats, that the vast majority of our kidney patients develop DQ on the bodies, the, the minimization there was, was, was to the one that is usually the biggest offender, right? It, it is dynamic. It's a dynamic thing. Let's not get hung up on crazy numbers right now. Hey, Massimo, we got we got the guy on the on the line who helped invent the original HLA nomenclature, Mike Checa. We'd love to have you weigh in. Um, any thoughts? Yeah, you have to unmute. Uh, I think uh, you know. In the beginning, we thought a lot about the difference between mismatches and whether certain antigens were worse than others to have mismatched or certain combinations were worse. And way back in the 90s, when the first amino acid sequences started to come out, we began working uh, on looking at the molecules in the way that, that you're doing now. And the EPLA system actually grew out of that uh, with uh, Rene Vicesno and Steve Takamoto. And uh, I think that the, the, the data that we based uh, a lot of this uh, drive to do kidney for life with is a little bit flawed because a lot of the patients in the, in the data sets are live related donors and related donors are totally different than unrelated donors. So we're basing, we're, we're going in the right direction with this and the NKR has the unique, I think, in the world opportunity to fill this data in and show uh, whether the, the data that we're basing this on is right and whether that's the way to go or, or you even have, because you've got much more data uh, that you're collecting, whether there's other methods that we might use to define compatibility in an even better way, including which kinds of antigens, which specific antigens you should really avoid, but which ones don't make much difference. And I think that the NKR has a great opportunity now uh, as more and more centers come into this to select these donors that look, look a lot more compatible and see whether this affects outcomes, whether it affects how uh, diligently you have to treat with immunosuppression. Uh, 
and whether you can make clinical decisions based on the, the HLA match. Yeah, so Mike, we do, we have a data collection uh, project underway right now. Uh, Massimo's overseeing it and we're, we're doing uh, uh, de novo DSA screening on all of the patients who have received high, medium, and low epilepsy mismatch since the beginning of the program. We've got about 200 plus uh, patients that we're targeting. We think by the end of the year, we'll have probably 400. So it will be a pretty good data set to start analyzing. We just don't have enough data yet to come to any conclusions, although the early data is directionally correct. It's directly the same as the five other uh, projects out there. I think uh, NKR is going to be uniquely positioned to give us answers to a lot of these questions. This is going to be a, a crucial role of NKR in the next few years. All right. Yep. So let's so let's talk about the expert system. Um, so go ahead and uh, to the next slide, Andre. So the executive summary essentially reducing de novo DSA reduces chronic rejection. It improves long-term graft survival and patient survival. We know this now. Uh, the problem that we have is oftentimes the transplant professionals, the clinicians, traditionally do not see the applet mismatch information until it's late in the process, if they even see it at all. And generally, by that point, the pair has already committed to a direct donation. So if the applet, in, applet mismatch information should be reviewed early in the transplant process before the uh, commitment to a direct donation transplant has been made, so that's why we created the expert system that helps solve this problem by streamlining the DNA collection and presenting the epilet mismatch data early in the process. Next slide. So every donor and recipient pair should have epilet mismatch information reviewed early in the process. Transplant professionals often see the information too late. The, oh wait, this is the same slide. Go to the next one, sorry. <laughs> Here's the workflow, sorry about that. Um, the donor process starts, you know, a registration is completed through the uh, donor automated screening and history or the DASH system. If you're doing pre-workup labs, the pre-workup labs would get completed. At that point, we'd ship a DNA cheek swab directly to the donor. Now you have two pathways at this point. So I'm at slide three, you'll see that there's either an arrow going right or an arrow going right to box number six. So at this point, the DNA cheek swab could be returned to the lab and you'll be notified that the donor's DNA has been uploaded, or right at the same time the donor cheek swab was shipped to the donor, you can link it to an existing patient already in NKR or enter a new patient and ship that DNA cheek swab to the patient as well. Uh, and this allows the DNA to get returned at the same time, streamlining the, uh, the speed of that process. At that point, the DNA cheek swab for the recipient would be returned to the lab, and then once both are returned and we have the results on file, you'll be at box number nine and you'll get a notification that that pair is ready. I mean, essentially it means the analysis is complete and you'll move to the expert system decision-making process, which is AI driven uh, and it's guidelines. It's not telling you what you should do. It's what you tell, you know, it's giving you the best recommendation what to do based on the DNA results, as well as, you know, the other information that you would use to make that decision. And essentially, you'd move into three different decisions. You can do a standard voucher, you can do a pair donation, which is your traditional KPD, or you can move into a new category called kidney for life direct. And that's either internal or remote, depending on where your donor is located. Uh, I just want to pause for a second here and take some questions or see if there's any additional comments that maybe Lisa or Annie from UMIN, who are you know, primary, primarily driving this there, I would want to offer on this workflow, the early portion of it. Sure. Um, Annie, did you want to chime in? Sure. Uh, Margaret's here as well. Um, yeah. So we've been doing this manually for a while and then now with the newer process, um, what we found um, is that, you know, it is, uh, it's a lot of work of kind of getting all these samples to these people and then sort of um, dogging all the samples. So the expert system is helping to streamline that. So that's uh, been helpful. Um, there's still a lot of, you know, it requires the patients to to do it, right? So we've sent a lot of kits and sometimes I might have 
um, a couple donors, but the recipient doesn't do the kit. And so that's kind of, a, you know, again, something you kind of have to continue to follow up on and sometimes ship new kits or things like that. So I guess, a, you know, we always talk about like an ideal way would be, you know, to do this at, at the recipient eval or at some touch point, maybe even in person to just kind of um, make sure we get this. So um, it's, it's exciting. It's, it's still um, a lot of work, but we use it um, all the time and we're always comparing. And so sometimes it'll be prior to the donor coming to eval and we're able to decide which donor comes forward because maybe the donor could go direct. Um, we've had a lot of zero epilet mismatch donors um, that we've been able to um, kind of prioritize out of our potential donors to donate. Um, and then we've used it certainly with all of our all of our recipients we've used this um, with in the last, I don't know, two, two years maybe. Um, and so it, the O's take a long time to find a low epaulet. Um, we have a lot of homozygosity in Minnesota, which has been challenging to find low epaulets. Um, we tend to keep people in for about three or four months um, to look for a low epaulet before sort of um, getting a little more liberal with what we're looking for um, and moving into mediums or considering direct. Thank you, Annie. Thoughts? And Annie, I just want to add, we recently uh, gave you the ability to use a cheek swab in your, without having to ship it. So you can actually use it uh, in your clinic. If you use the uh, bulk cheek swab, you can just take one right out of the envelope and do it right away. Yeah, and we do that a lot. Um, it's okay, just, yeah. you know, to kind of catch up. It's, it, I think it takes a little while to catch up. You know, I think yep. our future state, this will be a lot more, um, you know, will be a lot more manageable. It's, I think when you're starting, it's just a lot of people. We did start with our kids. That was our big priority. We took every single kid in evaluation and, and we made sure that they all got kits so that we could be really um, proactive in finding them a low applet match. So um, it's just kind of then kind of circling back to the broader groups, but uh, we do have them on site in the clinic and um, do swab people there if we haven't Great. caught them in the mail. Great. Hey, Andy, for the uh, benefit of the folks on the line, how is the reaction of been for the donors and the patients to this uh, approach? How, how are they reacting? Overwhelmed, um, but also impressed and excited. Um, I think Massimo's slides are something maybe we could adopt um, to explain it. We kind of came up with our own messaging and sort of explained HLA is um, cities and that epaulets are towns or villages. And so trying to, trying to make it palatable for you know the average person and um, immunology is a really complex topic for anyone um, and much less a lay person and so then trying to get into this molecular level is is challenging but I'd say for the most part you know people view it as well this is cutting edge technology and this is this is exciting and this is cool what's hard um, uh, we've seen, I guess, from a couple of our recipients, you know, our more sensitized recipients um, have, you know, maybe at the end, we, we weren't able to find them a low epaulet, and they really only had mediums or highs for months on end, and we really needed to then just find a really well-rounded donor and go for it. And they're, they're the, the last two people that we had to do that with felt a little like, oh, is this going to work? Is this a good thing? And um, we said, of course, it's a good thing. You know, it's it's still a great transplant, and it's still, you know, we still, um, you know, it anticipate it'll be successful. It's a living donor transplant, and just try to focus on all those other things. But that is, it's something that um, we've been educating them so much about that they're they are asking a lot of really good questions, um, and so we're kind of always evolving our our talking points and education. Annie, there was one more question before I move on to the next slide from Dr. Ali from NYU. And her question was, do all your patients go into NKR or do you still donate or do some still donate to a directed recipient? I'm assuming based, you know, on the epaulet mismatch. But what do you find most successful when discussing the epaulet, NKR and uncoupling with compatible uh, directed pairs? Um. What do we find the most successful in discussing with? Yeah, I mean, the compatible ones, I guess we just talk about how much they're able to leverage that compatible 
um, compatibility in NKR and, you know, how, although it's not preclusive, you know, to go direct that really we're opening up this entire world of a possibility to them. And, and usually that's, you know, exciting. And we also, another thing we, we leverage with them is the flexibility. And so we often say, um, Dr. Kandaswamy calls it a twirl, but we'll say we'll take a twirl in NKR. So that means we'll put them, we'll put them in there and we'll say, this is what we're looking for. Um, you know, a low applet and maybe this size or, you know, other things that are important to that particular recipient. And if we don't find this in three or four months, we'll schedule a direct transplant. And so I think knowing that we're nimble and flexible and we're really looking for the best situation for them that, um, that inspires their confidence in um, giving it a shot because I think then they realize they're kind of getting a two for one. They're able to sort of cruise cruise the pool and then also still be able to go direct if that's you know maybe the best route at the end of the day. Thank this you, is, Annie. This is Margaret. I just wanted to add to that. We have the wait list team in our meetings <coughs> daily as well. And so we're constantly analyzing, you know, how is the recipient faring? So getting their feedback is really important so you can make those decisions if you do have to change your tactics. Thank you, Margaret. All right, so next slide. So this is the, uh, the decision tree. So this is the, uh, the, the artificial intelligence that we, we develop that provide the guidelines. Now, again, keep in mind, these are all guidelines. Obviously the clinical decisions are always at the centers. They're not for NKR to make. These are just recommendations. So the first step is you look and see if the pair is compatible. If they're not compatible, obviously the right choice would be standard voucher. You uncouple them, allow that donor to donate, get the best possible match for that recipient. If they are a compatible pair, the next thing you want to look at is, are they a zero epilet mismatch? And again, we're not, we're not talking about surgical you know, complexities, anatomy, and all those other things. We're only looking at the, uh, the epilet information at this point. So if it's a zero epilet mismatch with their direct donor, you want to go to the kidney for life direct, whether they're internal or not. That also allows the donor to receive the donor shield protections and the living donor prioritization. If they're not a zero epilet mismatch, are they a low epilet mismatch with their direct donor? If they are a low epilet mismatch, can they get a zero epilet mismatch in less than two months? And again, that number is, you know, you can decide it could be three months, four months, or even one month, or is there only one available now? If they are a zero epilet, if a zero epilet mismatch is available in, in that time frame that you're looking for, you want to try pair donation. Now, we don't recommend standard voucher in this case because you want to have that direct donor available if they don't find the match that they're looking for. Because again, it's a low epilet mismatch, which is still a very good match. You want to have that donor available. So you try the standard KPD to see if that works. If you can't get a zero epilet mismatch and you've already got a low epilet mismatch direct donor in that time frame you're looking for, just go right away to the Kidney for Life Direct and get those donors, those protections. Now, if that direct donor is not a low epilet mismatch, but they are an intermediate epilet mismatch, the next thing you wanna do is look and see, can you get a low epilet mismatch in less than three months? And again, that's our guideline. It's not a requirement. If you can get a low epilet mismatch in less than three months, you should just go right ahead and do a standard voucher. If you can't get a low epilet mismatch in less than three months, can you get one in less than four months? If you can get one in less than four months, you should try pair donation. If not, you go right to Kidney for Life Direct. And then the last option is if that direct donor is a high epilet mismatch, and can you get a low epilet mismatch in less than four months, you should do standard voucher because you're going to get that low epilet mismatch. If not, if you, can you at least get one in less than five months? If so, you try paired donation. And again, if you can't get that low epilet mismatch in less than five months, you just go straight to the kidney for life direct. And again, those timeframes are, again, guidelines. They're not meant to be, you know, very specific and rigid. It's what's best for your patient. There could be a lot of other factors that go into making that decision. And those are all handled, you know, at the center, by the center, um, you know, so that, you know, you're, you're very involved in that decision making. So go to the next slide. So here's an example of what the expert system will provide. So this is an example here of a high epilepsy mismatch direct transplant 
And you can see that zero applet mismatch is available within one month. The recommendation in this case would be a standard voucher. Uh, again, you know, you can choose any of those options. You would just click the button and then everything happens behind the scenes, uh, to, you know, to, to allow that decision to move forward. We also include other pertinent information for helping you make that decision, such as the donor's blood type, recipient's blood type, uh, the CPRA level, and then the recipient dialysis status, because that could also help determine how much time you would want to take to look for that type of example. If you go to the next slide, this is a difficult upgrade. So this is where the patient has a high epilet mismatch directly with their donor. And based on the information that we have, you can see getting a low epi a zero epilet mismatch could take as much as six months. So and this, this is one where you don't know what the right decision would be. You know, that would have to be done at the, uh, the clinician level. In this case, we recommended a standard voucher because the zero and lows are available pretty quickly. Uh, but, you know, if this was, a, a, you know, if you wouldn't even see one at all, this would be one where you would want to just do an internal direct. Uh, next slide. So how do the patients benefits in this? We, we've seen so far is that 70 to 90% of direct donation transplants are intermediate or high alloimmune risk matches. And what we've also seen is that 95% of patients will see a low up mismatch donor in the NKR within three months, and then 50% of those patients will see a zero epilet mismatch within three months. Next slide. So I'm gonna pause for a moment before we talk about the antibody screening to see if anybody had any questions about the decision tree or the expert system in general. Yeah, Matt, I, I got a question for uh, Raj and Annie and the human folks. Uh, Matt just quoted some wait times. Uh, and percentages, uh, what are you seeing in, in sort of real life? That was based on simulation. Um, what are you seeing? What are you seeing in real life? That's a good one. Yeah, if you go back to that uh, that uh, chart that you showed, Matt, uh, the, the one before this, the decision tree. Uh, the, the one thing we have to remember is this decision tree only looks at applet matching in isolation, right? That's the only factor it takes into account. Uh, epilet matching is not the only factor when you look at a donor. You're looking at a variety of factors. You could get a low epilet mismatch in two months, but though that donor could be 70 years old with two arteries with, uh, you know, big cysts in the, the, uh, or a GFR that's 80 for a young recipient. So the, there's a variety of things that we have traditionally looked at for donor assessment, which are not thrown out of the window. <laughs> they are all still there. They are primary drivers of donor acceptance. And I think this is what Mikhail was referring to earlier. How do you weigh this against all the other factors? All the other factors that we considered for, for an organ donor quality are still mm -hmm. operative. This is added to that. Uh, also, yeah, also the, PR, the PRA of your, your recipient, right? If you have I'll get to that in a moment, PR. Mikhail. Yeah. yeah. I, I think once you're dealing with a high PRA recipient, avoidance of DSA is way more important than applet matching. Even low-level DSA, uh, in fear of an anamnestic response, we would avoid. And, and take whatever epilet match there is available. They've self-selected out the ones they're gonna develop antibodies to. So the high PRAs I think are a different kettle of fish, but, but even amongst the low PRA patients, uh, the quality of the donor age, size, GFR, uh, anatomy, all those things are put in and then epilets are added to that. The graph that he showed earlier in the next slide only tells you what you see in the system. It doesn't tell you what the quality of the donor is in all other respects. And it also doesn't tell you whether that donor is going to be offered to you. It just shows it, tells you that it's going to show up on the board. They could all have orange locks or red locks on them. So even though you see it, you will never get it. So I think all these you've got to think about when you when you use this predictive tool. And, and I think we need, we need to work on enhancing this predictive tool. I'm just not sure how yet, but I'm sure there are some software folks who can work on that to actually predict accurately when you might be assigned one as opposed to just see one. Well, seeing doesn't mean a whole lot. Now, if you won't see one for six months, that is meaningful. If it says you will not see a low mismatch for six months, I think that'll be meaningful data. But just because you'll see one in one month does not mean you will actually see it. So 
Hey, um, I think, thank you, Raja. Those are fantastic points. But I think also right here, I want to urge everybody to take these as just the tools that it is, which is giving you the heads up, right? Uh, it was mentioned before of all these one haplotype patients. This one is telling you, don't even think about it, right? Even if you find yourself in the position where all these donors are beautiful and perfectly donors, you're not going to see a low because of the genetic of your patient. So I think this is a, yes, nothing is perfect. And, and already discussed, we got about the CPRA. They should be added in the next version of this. But the, the point here, as Raja, is, is for if you are, when you are considering to bring this up to your patient, this thing is giving you the heads up whether you even going to have to bring it up right as a possibility but yes of course it doesn't have any any correlation with the fact that you will get an offer in two months but if you see the curve like the next one i don't know maybe you shouldn't bring that up and consider the fact that you need to settle down to whatever you can thank you massimo and i just want to add since we're just about out of time before i talk about the antibodies if anybody wants a, a more in-depth demonstration of the expert system please either reach out directly to me or reach out to your center liaison and we'll make sure we get one scheduled with you. All right, so the next uh, topic is, is the antibody screening QAPI process that we're, we're going through. I'm actually gonna turn this over to Massimo to talk about very quickly. Um, if you don't mind, Massimo, thank you. No, no, absolutely. So what, what we wanted to do essentially is to have some, some quality uh, um, in this system. And, and if it's indeed true that if you engineer transplant to be a low risk, that at least within the first year, like it was observing in some other uh, living donor courts, we are within the expected number of the novel DSA. And uh, the, the first thing that I want to stress right here is that the, the, the review is still on, on the hands of the, your lab director for the HLA. And please consider the time in when these antibodies is detected, all right? And I mean, the, 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 way, the way this system is done is we're gonna check out one year, but the, the, if, if something comes up within less than four weeks, it's most likely not at the novel DSA, all right? The novel DSA generally should take four to six weeks to pop up. If and that's why we do the first screening at 30 days, by the right. way. Right. So if you're right, exactly. So 30 days is, is a good mark. If you see something before that, you should consider that. It's what in many papers that is called early uh, DSA. Um, so laboratory directors will have access. Everything is done remotely. There is no cost to the recipient. There is no cost and there is no activity that the center needs to do. This is all coordinated in the background by NKR. Once the, you, you will know that a kid will be shipped, you will receive an email. And when the results are in, the, your lab director will receive an email and he or she can go to the system and see actually uh, almost similarly to what they will see in Easter track they, they will, or in Matilda, whatever they use as a, their LIS. You see the entire beats, you can click in every column of that pop-up that you have. If you want to organize the, the antibody by locus or by MFI or by any combination for flea to kick, click right there. You see the raw data, just like you will see in your lab, you have the possibility to override because of course, to make things simple, we had to create a system of alerts. So we put a very, very low and genetic cutoff of a thousand. And the uh, beads, they are specific for, for the donor that was transplanted are color coded. So you can immediately see when you scroll down which beads are related to, to the donor. And the color would change to red if they are above a thousand. You're still gonna go and consider that, you know, classic situation, you have a DP1 that is positive, another DP1 that is negative, will not call, a call DP1 in that case. But you can click on the antigen, align everything by DP, you can clearly see that that doesn't make sense. And the initial data seems to clearly correlate indeed with what Colorado has been seeing. And the, the scope of this is to create a quality insurance program within this kidney for life system to make sure that indeed this engineering is performing as expected. 
Thanks, Massimo. And if you if you want to talk about the uh, clinical trials that you're uh, starting at NYU, yes, as well. I don't know if Dr. Mongovi is online, but uh, yeah, we 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 want to do. Of course, one of the goal, Raja has mentioned this, and other other in the call has. You know, everything is based on retrospective data, non-compliant uh, populations, so we more or less. Uh, you know, match among, uh, you know, many related we have, many are related. There is a lot of questions out there. I, I think, I think the, the, I think applet evens everything out because applets don't care about relationship. Uh, but, um, but it is important to do the study prospectively and show that prospectively actually this thing works. So we are working, we're trying to work with some grant proposal to do a, a prospective study on living donor to show the proof of concept, uh, even with some immune suppression.